Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We've told you in times past of a program called Quiet, Please, Willis Cooper's classic follow-up to Lights Out. And the sad part is we probably have no more than, we don't even have a dozen good quality episodes of Quiet, Please, because they were maintained so poorly. But one that we have to air every year about this time is an episode of Quiet, Please, from the oil fields. From August 9th, 1948, The Thing on the Forble Board. Mutual Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called The Thing on the Furbel Board. Me, I'm a roughneck. Well, I was a roughneck, I mean, 20 years ago, a little too old, too slow now. Besides, I got a dollar now, I don't have to be a roughneck, you see. Married, got a nice home. Had to meet my wife. Hey, Mike. Her name's Maxine, but she likes to be called Mike. Mike! I guess she's busy out in the kitchen someplace. Besides, she doesn't hear very well. Shame, too, she's so pretty and everything. Well, you'll meet her. Sit down. I was saying I was a roughneck. Well, no, that doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. A roughneck is an oil field worker, specifically a guy in a drilling crew. Call them roughnecks like you call a section hand on the railroad a gandy dancer, a garage hand a grease monkey. Same time you work around a drilling crew for a while, you're going to be a roughneck in every sense of the word, boy. A derrick floor or a forble board is no place for a guy with a bow tie. Because you know, when you have to fool around with drilling holes that go farther down the ground than it is from the top of Pike's Peak down to sea level... Yeah, sure they do. By the time I was a roughneck, we'd got this one well down to 7,313 feet. That was a record. But last May, Pure Oil brought one in out in the Toronto Valley in Wyoming at 14,309 feet. That, friend, is almost three miles. Quite a hole, that, huh? Sure, I don't think there's an oil man in the world that don't wonder one time or another what's down there besides rock and oil and gas. Oil that's made out of trees that died 20 million years ago. Oil that's made out of dinosaur bones. Oil that's maybe made out of the flesh and blood of men, maybe, that beat each other to death with a stone axe. Ate saber-toothed tiger for lunch. Yeah, you get to wondering. You look at the cores that come up from way down there, and sometimes the little shells, trilobites mostly, that was alive when Manhattan Island, where New York is, was under half a mile of ice. We found something once, me and Billy Grunwald, and something found us. I'll tell you about it. We were down to around 5,400 feet. We'd set casing. We began to get water, so we hadn't stopped drilling and cement off. Well, you see, when water begins to seep in the hole, you pull your drill pipe. Then you let down a cementing shoe inside the casing, and you plug up the bottom of the hole, casing and all, with quick-hardening waterproof cement. Then when it's hard, you drill through the cement and go on down, and the cement outside the casing at the bottom keeps the water out. Well, we had the drill pipe all pulled and cracked. The cement was setting, see? So we was shut down, waiting for it to harden. We'd been coring just before. Well, you see, a, a core drill is hollow, and as the bit digs down, it stuffs the drillings up inside it, so when you pull it out, you got a sample of the kind of stuff you're going through. And a geologist can tell a lot from that. So there's nobody around the rig except me that night. The rest of the crew's going into town. I was toasting some pork chops over the forge for myself, so I heard a car pulling up. Look out, it's Billy Grunwald, the geologist. Then I give him a hello. Hi, Billy, come and have a pork chop. Hi, Porky. 
Ah. Where's everybody? They all went to town. I'm the whole crew. You know, I had three blowouts between here and Oxnard. Yeah, I wondered where you was. Ted said you'd be in here about three. Yeah, I would have been, except for my tough luck. Oh, oh I'm dead. Yeah, hungry? Starved. Yeah, I got six, no, oh, seven pork chops. And bread. And some coffee, kind of. Swell. Hey, I got a bottle in the car. <laughs> if we going to have a banquet. Hey, where's that core? That's what I came up here to look at. Yeah, back there on the bench. <laughs> look at it after supper. Hey. What? Didn't you say you were all alone here? Uh-huh. I thought I heard somebody talking. Mm-hmm. I don't see anybody. We'll keep an eye on that pork chop. You won't have any supper. Yeah, I'm watching it. Here, let me put the coffee on. Like so. When did you finish cementing? This morning. Last tower only made about ten feet of hole, so Ted shut down before we get flooded out of house and home. Funny about that water. Mm-hmm. How? Oughtn't to be any at that level, according to my figuring. Well, there is. Is it salt? Sure, right out of the bottom of the ocean. Hmm, that's funny. Well, maybe I'll be able to tell something from the core. Yeah, I hope so. The last core I looked at, I'd have sworn we were getting into shale. Mm, Ain't seen none yet from the cuttings. That's funny. Here, your pork chop's done. Yeah, take some bread. Yeah, thanks. Oh, man. Good, huh? <laughs> yeah, put on another. I have two already before you come. Yeah, much obliged. Yeah, you know, you never can tell what's down there. You get it all mapped and plotted out, all the strata. And all you know is what comes out of the hole. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to go down there sometime if I was little enough. <laughs> never get you down a hole. Yeah, you'd fit. You're skinny. I'll stay up here and look at the cores, bud. Where is that one? Behind you. Over there. Hmm? Oh. Well, I'll have a look at it. Well, why don't you wait till you finish your supper? I'm just going to look at it. Uh, put on another pork chop for me. Okay. Well, I wish I was screech out of the key. What's the matter? Hey, wait a minute, Porky. Well, why did... Listen. <laughs> What's eating you? you? You know, I'd have sworn there's somebody up there in that portable board. Ah, you're crazy. There's nobody up there. You're going to get those stands of drill pipes. Ah, they're just rack crooked. One of them slipped. Come on back and eat your pork chop. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess so. Only I... Ah, what you so jittery about, Billy? Come on, eat your sandwich. Here. Yeah, well, thanks, Porky. I don't know. I, I'm just naturally that way, I guess. I'm always scared of the dark. I'm scared. Doc Gunner, I... I hate to be a baby, but I can't help it. Scared of the dark? Honest? Stupid, ain't it? Oh, I don't know. Everybody's scared of something. Me? Spiders scare the tar out of me. Black widows. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I know how you feel, Billy. There another light over here? Yeah. Yeah. Here. Ah. Huh. That's better. Hey, listen, uh, Porky. Go out to the car and look in the left-hand door pocket and bring back that bottle, will you? That's what I need. Okay, kid. Okay. So I picked up a flashlight. I turned around and went outside. I found the car. Then I got the bottle. And the floor of the derrick was all lit up. And when I saw a beam of light suddenly flash up toward the forbo board, <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> Billy Grunewald and his ideas... Sure, I looked up. There wasn't a darn thing up there except the drill pipe racked against the fingerboard. Oh, this, uh, forble board. Well, you've seen oil derricks or pictures of them. You know that little platform that runs around the outside of the derrick about halfway up? Well, that's the forble board. Well, you see, drill pipe comes in lengths, and you handle them with several lengths screwed together so as to save time getting them in and out of the hole. Two lengths is a double, three is a thribble, four is a forble. When you pull a pipe, you heist it up inside the derrick of the traveling block, which moves up and down from the crown block at the top of the derrick. And then when a forble of pipe is pulled out, it's held in the rotary table. You break the joint with tongs, like a great big stilts and rent, you see. Snub a cable that's fastened to the handle over the cat head on the draw works, and that breaks the joint. Then you hold the tongs on the pipe, give the rotary table a few turns to unscrew it. You heist away with the traveling block and swing it over against the fingerboard, lean it against the derrick. 
The guy up on the forbal board takes off the traveling block. You do it all over again till you got all the pipe out, you see? Well, there wasn't anybody up on the forbal board uh, except a screech owl, and it flew away. So Billy turned his light off, and I come on inside. And just as I come up the steps, he let out a yell. Yay! What's the matter? What's the matter, Billy? Hey, come here. Look here. Well, what's it? Look, Porky. My... Where did you find that? Now, listen, Porky. I give you my word. That was embedded in the core. Why, it couldn't be. I tell you, it was. Look where I dug it out. You know what? That rock there comes from a mile underground. And it's been a mile underground for a million years. And look at this. And I did look. And what he was holding was a gold ring. And it was all carved and filigreed, just like jewelry. And there wasn't any kidding about it. It was real. From August 9th, 1948, Quiet Please on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more The Thing on the Forable Board, an episode of Quiet Please from August 9th, 1948. No, 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 wait a minute. Hang on, I ain't done. I poked at the core of rock that looked like a uh, kind of petrified salami or something. And then it was my turn to pretty near jump out of my pants. Because right alongside the place where Billy dug out the ring, there was a mud-covered but very unmistakable finger. I picked it up, and it was cold, and it was heavy, and it was solid rock. At least it felt like solid rock. And I looked at Billy, and Billy looked at me. He started to rub the mud off this here stone finger. And as he rubbed it, it began to disappear. No, he could he could still feel it, he said, but when the mud was gone, neither one of us could see it. And he dropped it to the derrick floor. It went clunk, and we couldn't find it any place. So you know what we've done? When we took that bottle and we took and finished it, Billy and me, we finished it in one slug of peas, and it was a full pint of bathtub gin. It tasted just like so much well water to me. We sat down on the derrick floor and we looked at each other. We didn't say a word. My eyes got heavier and heavier. The last thing I remember was I heard some kind of noise that seemed to be coming up from down the forbal board 80 feet above us. I shut my eyes a minute. I guess I went to sleep. Awful dreams. Black widow. Spiders crawling all over me with gold rings on their legs. Things I could hear but I couldn't see. Up on the forbal board. Billy Grunewald climbing up the ladder outside the derrick in the moonlight. Faces looking at me and I couldn't figure out who they were. Then I was waked up by a horrible scream. The crash came inside me that shook the whole derrick. I opened my eyes to see Billy Grunwald lying on the floor two feet away with a broken neck. With a broken neck and his left hand. Well, he put the gold ring on the little finger of his left hand and the way his arms were spread out. His left little finger and the ring were gone. I got out of there. I run down to where Billy had left his car, and I got in. I stepped on the starter, and I couldn't get it to go, and then I remembered after I'm pretty near run down the battery that Billy had taken a key. I wasn't going up there and go through a dead man's clothes to get it. So I sat there in the car and shivered all by myself till daylight. And then Ted and the crew came. 
Afterwards, a state cop and everybody in the world was asking me questions. Did you and Billy have a fight, Porky? I told you we didn't, Ted. But you had been drinking. We only had that little pike, Ted. Well, what was he doing up on the football board? Did you threaten him, and did he run up there to get away from Listen, you? Listen, cop, don't be a chump. Billy Grunewald and I were good friends. Then why'd you push him off the four board? I didn't, I tell you. I, I wasn't up there. Well, what did he go up there for? I don't know. I was asleep. How do you know he was up there? I didn't say he was. You said so. Besides, how would he break his neck if he didn't fall from way up there? Well, look, officer. I think it was just another accident. I mean, we haven't got anything on Porky, and personally, I don't believe he did it. Well, so. it's mighty mysterious. Well, so it is. But we got work to do. Now, how about it? That cement's hard down there. I want to start drilling again, and I'm short-handed. Will you let Porky stay here till I run in my pipe again, and... Well, then you can take him and ask him questions till you're blue in the face. Well, all right. Okay. Let's get rolling. You got steam up, Happy? I'm all set. All right. Porky, you go from the formal board. What? Not me, Ted. Oh, don't be such a boob. There's nobody up there to shove you overboard. And you can put a safety line around you if you want to. And besides, you're getting paid to do what you're told. I've lost too much time already. I'm getting going. So, okay, I go up on the forbal board. And you can bet I took a good gander around before I did anything else. Now I couldn't see a thing. So I signaled to the driller to let down the traveling block, and he did. Came sailing down from up above. I was just reaching for it to pick up the first four bullet drill pipe. Gave a big jerk, and the cable broke. It dropped and nearly pulled me off the four bullet. And it landed right on top of Ted. And if you have any idea what a guy looks like after two tons of metal land on him from 80 feet up, yeah, you keep your ideas to yourself. Enough two accidents in a row. The whole crew quit. They, they wasn't going to wait for a third. And it was Ted's money that was paying off. There wasn't any more. And as far as I know, the abandoned Derek is still there. And that was 20 years ago. Oh, I forgot to tell you something. That traveling block was right in front of my face when it broke loose. It was hanging by steel cable, three quarter inch steel cable. And I saw that cable break right before my eyes. It looked just like a piece of string when you snap it between your fingers. I could almost see the fingers. You know what? There was something up there on the forbal board with me. And so a couple of days later I came back. I, I don't know if there's anything in the world as desolate as dismal... As dead-looking as an abandoned oil well rig. There it stands like a skeleton off on a deserted side road in the bare yellow hill surrounding it, and it's the deadest thing you ever saw. I sat in my car for a long time looking at it. Everything was just the way we'd left it. I, I looked in at the floor. The smashed traveling block was there alongside the rotary table. There was a little mutter of steam from the boiler. That was all. Then I heard a tinkle of something as it hit the ground alongside me. I looked around. There wasn't a soul in sight. But at my feet was the gold ring that Billy Grunewald and I had found in the core of rock that came from a mile underground and from a million years ago in time. And I heard a little sound. The sound of a kid crying. And there wasn't any kid up there. And I heard it again and it came from above my head and... And I, and I took out my revolver. I loaded it carefully. I started up the ladder to the forbal board. No, well, there wasn't anything up there, nothing I could see. But there was a voice crying. The voice of a little kid. And then there was a movement behind the rack of drill pipes, and I saw the pipe move, and I yelled, Come out of there, whoever you are! Come out, or I'll start shooting! And the stand of pipe shivered, and I thought, what can it be that can handle that heavy pipe like... like Jack Straws? And then there was a crash. The whole stand of pipe fell over and I just got out of the way in time. And I was alone on the forbal board with the thing. 
but I couldn't see it. I felt the platform tremble under my feet again as something moved toward me. I fired two or three shots. And nothing happened. I started backwards. I knew it was following me because I could hear it meowing like a cat. My feet tripped over something. I saw it was a big can of red lead that somebody had left up there. Without thinking, I picked it up and I threw it at the sound and it splashed. August 9th, 1948. Quiet, please, on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Hi, this is Kyle Horvath with the White Pine County Tourism and Recreation Board. If you want to get away from the big cities and get back to nature this summer, give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. There's so much to do and see, I can't mention it in 30 seconds, but check out our website and you'll see what Nevada is really all about. elynevada.net or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. The buy one, get one free special going on now at MyPillow. MyPillow bed sheets, Giza Elegance MyPillows, the roll and go, go anywhere MyPillows, and a six-piece towel sets on special. Go to MyPillow.com slash USA, use promo code USA, or call 1-800-951-8175 and find out all the great deals you can get right now at MyPillow. MyPillow.com slash USA. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the startling conclusion to Quiet, Please, and the thing on the Forable Board, August 9th, 1948. And there it was. And I wish I... I wish... The face of a little girl, frightened, crying with hunger and terror. Hands like a human being and a finger... Missing from the left hand. And a body. Well, I'll tell you about that. I told you how I'm scared of spiders. But I knew where it came from. It had come from the bowels of the earth, come riding up on the drill pipe as we yanked it out of the well. Come to an alien world and was lost. It stood there dripping with red paint, blood red from head to foot like some horrible dream. And it put its hand on my arm. Its hand was stone. Living, moving stone. And it looked into my eyes and mewed like a lost kitten. Twenty years ago, I discovered many things about it, what it used for food, that it was deaf, that it was invisible and couldn't see people when it was invisible, that if you sprayed it with mud or paint or grease paint, makeup, then it could see people. And believe me, I didn't want to see its body. I can see that in my nightmares. But its face, I can't help wanting to see that pathetic little girl face. I'm afraid maybe I've fallen. Ah, But it's very beautiful. And when it's well made up, it's... But making it up, rubbing grease paint on a stone face that looks at you and smiles and it makes sounds like a lost kitten yet. I can disguise the body in long dresses. She can't hear very well. And when she's hungry, I have to stay out of her way. I found out what she likes to eat, remember? No, no, sit still. Sit still, do. Sit still or I'll have to shoot you. I want you to meet my wife. Or rather, my wife wants to meet you. Mike. Mike. There she is. Come on in, dear. The 
title of tonight's Quiet Please story is The Thing on the Furble Board. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper and featured Ernest Chappell. And Dan Sutter played Billy Grunwald. Pat O'Malley was Ted. And Cecil Roy <laughs> was also a member of the cast. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Sound? Sound by our good friend Albert April. Now, for a word about next week, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Well, I'm reasonably sure that all the characters in tonight's stories were completely fictional. At least I, for one, hope so. Next week, the story is called Presto Changeo, I'm sure. <laughs> And so, until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, August 9th, 1948. Quiet, please, on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We move from horror to something much kinder and gentler. An episode of the soap opera Claudia, this originally broadcast on August 9th, 1948. Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the famous play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax. And while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. Just look out at those fields, darling. Oh, isn't it a wonderful evening? Mm Mm-hmm. It's one in a million. Mm. Hand me a piece of that candy. Oh. Thank you. You are. Pretty good. It's not bad being alone, is it? Nope, not bad at all. Can you believe we're by ourselves in this house? With the baby upstairs sound asleep. <laughs> Knock wood. Hey, move over and make room for me. Why is it that you like this chair best? Oh, is it the chair? I thought it was you. <laughs> Go on, move over. Don't be so greedy. Uh, greedy, she called me. All I want is a fair share of the chair. Oh, you're so beautifully upholstered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hard as nails. Nice when Mom is here, too, of course. Very nice, darling. I like having her with us. I don't know what I'd do without Mama. But just for an evening... Mm-hmm, it's perfect. And Mama knows it, too. Mm. Mama knows it best of all. That's why she went into town for tonight. Mama went in town because Aunt Louisa was sick. Mama was probably delighted to have an excuse to get some peace and quiet. I hope she doesn't feel in the way here. I think you're the one who's in the way. As a matter of fact, you're smothering me. Oh, what's a little smother between friends? Uh. Well... She's coming back tomorrow. Look, darling, just let Mama go when she wants to go and where she wants to. And she'll never feel in the way. Too bad she didn't have somebody like you all her life. The last thing that Mama wants is your pity. I don't pity, I just worry. Yes, and uselessly. Just remember, it it would have been worse for somebody of less caliber than Mama. Mm, That's true. Oh, I don't want to do... Anything ever but sit in this chair with you. Well, you're going to be pretty uncomfortable when I start reading my book. Do you have to do that? Mm-hmm. Any objections? Yes. You always have to be doing something. Just when I'm comfortable. Can't we just talk? Oh, oh we'll talk. Reading a book isn't going to stop you. Well, if I have to get out of this chair, I will. Oh, all right. I'm licked. You're licked. Mm. <laughs> There. Put your arm around my neck. Oh, that's lovely. You'll be more comfortable that way. There. How's that? Bliss. Say, I hope Fritz and Bertha are enjoying themselves downtown. Mm Mm-hmm. They say where they were going specially? No, I I told them to hop in the car and get acquainted with Eastbrook. Well, I am going to hop in the car and start driving around any day now. Mm -mm, Mm-mm, mm-mm. My careless hours, free from worry, are about to finish. Your confidence in me is so reassuring. No, nothing at all. No, I bet if I weren't married to you, you'd think I was good. But you are married to me, so that's that. Now get your hand from out inside my collar. But I love the back of your neck. 
You know, it was the first thing I noticed about you. I married you for the back of your neck. <laughs> well, it's, it's nice to finally know the reason for things. When I think of you, I think of the back of your neck. Uh-oh. Oh. Did you hear the door talk? Yes, I think I did. Don't answer it. I'd love not to. It was probably only a rabbit coming in for a carrot. Or, or a frog for a bowl of milk. Mm. Hey, where are you going? To give the frog his bowl of milk. Come back here. I have no place to put my arm. Oh, hold it in the air for a minute. I just want to look out and see who it is. Well, don't stand up so straight or they'll see you. Well? Well, who is it? It is either a very small man or a little boy. Make up your mind. Must be a little boy because he has freckles. Oh. Oh, I know it's the youngster we met fishing with the branch, the string, and the worm. Which one? Oh, oh, I, re I remember. I, 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 I landed my best rod. And he caught the best trout. Yes, he did. Yeah, I wonder what he's doing here at this hour of the night. He's probably looking for more trout. Oh, it was so nice being all alone. Uh, he, uh, he isn't tall enough to see over the edge of the window. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I am. Have you no conscience? None whatsoever. Oh, David, but he's come all the way over here to see us. No. Yeah. He does look sort of lost, standing there in the dark. I says, there's something lost about all children who don't have a father like you, I says. Or who just don't have a father. Oh, I forgot his father died. Well, that settles it. We'll let him in. Weakling. Oh, hush up. You're no better. Hello, man. Well, hello. So it's you. Yeah, it's me. Hi. I was starting to think you were out. We were, but we changed our minds. Well, it's good to see you again. Yeah, it sure is good. I, uh, I hope you don't mind my coming around at this hour. Oh, no, no, not at all, not at all. We were just, uh, this minute wondering when you are going to come around to see us, weren't we, Claudia? Yeah, mm-hmm. Well, I thought tonight would be a good time. I didn't have anything else important to do. Have you been fishing again? Uh, come on in, don't stand out there. No, oh, sure I have. But I never caught a fish as big as the one we caught that day. Not we, you caught it. All by yourself. Well, not exactly. But it certainly was a big fish. Uh, come in here and sit down. Well, I'm not interrupting anything. I mean, you weren't busy or something. No. No, My no. My mother said that older people are busy and you mustn't interrupt them. No, we weren't busy at all. Maybe we're not that much older. Well, you look, you look fine. Have yourself a nice tan. Yeah, school's been out. So have you. <laughs> well, I've been around. You've uh, been having a nice vacation? It's been all right. What have you been doing? Oh, I haven't been doing much. Helping Mom out most of the time. Your schoolmates have been vacationing. Must be a little lonesome. Oh, it's always sort of dead in the summer. But, well, I uh, guess that's just the way it is. I suppose it's lonesome for your mother, too. Yeah, it is, kind of. That's why I have to stay around the house. You see... I'm the man in the family, and every lady needs a man, my mother says. How right your mother is. Uh, you've been away. I've come around, but you're out. Yes, we've uh, we've been in town for a few weeks. My mother says you got a son now. That's why we were away. <laughs> she says she heard he's a fine big boy. <laughs> well, so we decided to keep him. He's all right, except he eats too much and outgrowing his clothes already. He is? Mm. Oh, I thought I'd come over and say hello to him. Well, that's very nice. Say, you'll be his first guest. Oh, I... Hope he won't mind me dropping in like this without being invited. No, oh, he won't mind. He's upstairs. Don't you want to come up and see him? Oh, I sure do. Oh, but please wait a sec. I got something for him outside the door. Present? Oh, it ain't much, but maybe you'll like it. This is one baby present that really means something. <laughs> I bet it will. Okay, let's go up. Why, it's a wooden wagon. On my word. Isn't that wonderful, David? With red wheels, a very handsome wagon. I made it. It's not so awful good, but it rolls. The next one I make will be better. Bobby's going to love it. You'll see. Bobby is his name? Yeah. Mm, Claudia wanted to call him Ebenezer, but I wouldn't let her. Now, oh, here. Where will I put the light on? There we are. Is this his room? All his. It's... It's kind of sissy, ain't it? Well, just for the present. He doesn't notice it much. I, um... I think it's kind of sissy, too, but uh, you know how women are. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Well, where is he? Shh. I'll just pull the blankets back. 
There he is. He's asleep. Is that him? That's all there is, so far. He's so small. Well, he's really pretty big for his age. He's... he's nothing but a baby. Lucky for me. But my mother said you had a son. He is, but he... He'll uh, grow up. Matter of fact, he'll grow up to be just like you. He'll grow up to be like me? Mm Mm-hmm. He's so small. Well, you were small like that, too. Well, I don't remember. (laughs) Neither will he. But I thought you had a son. I came over to ask him if he'd play with me. Gee, Willikers, why, my wagon's bigger than he is. I'm sorry, but, well, we couldn't help it. It's really better this way, to start off with. He looked awfully small to me for a while, too. Matter of fact, he still does. I don't see how you can call him anything. We're optimistic. Well, then, I guess I might as well go along. Guess I'll have to just look for somebody else to play with. Anyway, I guess I like to be alone best of all. Um, look, Bobby's too small for you. Hmm, it's not so good to play alone, though, is it? No, not so good. Uh, come on downstairs, fella. You coming, darling? Yes, I'm coming. Does he sleep all the time? Most of the time, thank goodness. Except when he's eating. That's an awful way to be. Sleeping is the worst part of being awake. I think so, too. But you know, it's very important to growing boys. Like Bobby. That's what my ma says. She says I gotta get my sleep. But heck, it's an awful waste. Sure is. What are you doing, David? Well, I... I thought we could sit down here and have a game of checkers together. Me? Well, you were invited to watch. You mean you and me? Sure thing. You play checkers, don't you? Oh, sure. Sure, I'm a humdinger at checkers. Well, I haven't played them in a long time, so you'll probably beat the pants off of me. Are you sure... Are you sure you want to play checkers with me? You bet I do. My wife is terrible. Terrible at checkers. I never get a decent game anymore. I just can't seem to remember which color I am. Well, I'm glad you came around tonight because I was sitting here saying to myself I'd like a good, tough game of checkers, but Claudia isn't up to it. You have to be pretty bright for checkers. Watch what you say, David. Yes, you have to be pretty bright for checkers. That is the end. Now, don't you think you ought to call up your mother and tell her you'll be out a while? Oh, I guess so. I guess I ought to. The phone's over there under the passageway. Well, there goes our private evening together, darling. Yup. There it went. I I couldn't very well ask him to leave, could I? Couldn't you? I know we'd planned on just sitting around alone together, and that's all I wanted, but... But, but, but... But, gosh, he was... He was so disappointed that Bobby was only a baby, and... <laughs> well, I'll... I'll let him beat me quickly, and then... Let we'll... him beat you. Mm. I bet he does beat you. Darling. Darling, look at me. Yes. This, uh, this isn't the way I wanted to spend our evening. I, I hope you're not too disappointed. I would have been if you hadn't. You were born to be a father, darling. There's no getting away from it. Did I ever tell you that I like the stuff you're made of? Well, it's always nice to hear. Oh, David, for a little boy to be lonesome. That's a very special and terrible feeling, isn't it? Yes, I I think so. Please, God, our son will never be lonesome. When the heat of the day adds to the burden of housework, why don't you give yourself a recess and reach into the refrigerator for an ice-cold bottle of Coca-Cola? The friendly pause for Coke is becoming more and more popular with folks who work, no matter whether it's in offices, factories, stores, or right at home. You'll see why... Once you work refreshed. Mr. King, how'd you like a game of checkers? Well, first I'd like to know how you came out with Mr. Norton. Oh, I came out okay. He took me one game, I took three. Mm, That's pretty good. Uh, For you. Uh, But I promised him a return match for next week sometime. I bet he does nothing between now and then but practice up for you. Oh, are you going to play with me? Mm, I might, but uh, you're too good for me, I think. Say, son, do you have any livestock on your place? Oh, just a couple of chickens. No cow or a pig? I sure would like to have one, especially a pig. But Mom says they're too much trouble. Jared Tucker's going to have some of that trouble tomorrow with his prize pig. Well, he better get hold of a vet. Not if he can. If not, uh, well, we'll see who helps him tomorrow. Good night, son. So long, Mr. King. 
Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. And ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. These broadcasts are adapted for radio by Manya Starr, and the entire production is supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. Like I said, such a very, very sweet show. From August 9th, 1948, Claudia here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. And you remember uh, the young boy they were talking with there, Bobby, uh, does not have a father. So that gives you an idea of why... Uh, David is so very, very protective of him and uh, wants to be there for him. Thank you so much for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox here on your favorite station. Please thank this station. Support their advertisers. It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite station. Don't forget, if you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single show. All of our shows are available on demand at our web page, classicradio.stream. You can stream the shows on demand. You can uh, find links of places where you can also get the shows. You can also learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can contact me, find our social media links. And if you like what we do and like to help us find some new shows, uh, you can buy me a coffee. That buy me a coffee link, uh, all that money that we get through buy me a coffee because I don't drink coffee, helps us to acquire more great classic radio theater programs. Classic radio dot stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic radio theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.